how to ensure control and ownership of a phone number, Cubes OS production challenges, and how to privately watch short form content. Welcome to the Q&A where we answer questions from our amazing patrons who allow us to make this podcast free for all of you. So you can view and join the questions and join the Q&A for our next week's Q&A on patreon.com slash surveillance pod. Literally, if you join right now, um, you can go ahead and leave your question and get it answered next week. So uh, we'll leave that link down below and you get to support our podcast. So we're going to start with David Johnson, who asks, what do you think is currently the best option to ensure maximum ownership and control as a priority over confidentiality of a phone number? So just to kind of condense this a little bit, he points out that phone numbers are often the only option to protect certain accounts like banking, which typically uses SMS 2FA, as well as uh, the way they've kind of morphed into tracking numbers, almost as sensitive as a social. He notes that there are basically four existing options, like a SIM card, which you can't prepay long term for. Google Voice, which has inactivity policies and Google's history of killing products, consumer VOIP like MySudo, Newish, which are uncertain and staying in power, and enterprise VOIP products like Twilio, which tend to be hostile towards individual users. How do you try to maximize the likelihood of your continued ownership of your phone number given this state of affairs? I think this is going to be very personal preference, and I know Nate's probably going to have interesting stuff to say. I personally have a SIM number that I try to pretty much never use at all costs, and that's actually been fairly successful. Google Voice has been a very, very powerful thing for me. I know you say that there's inactivity policies and Google has a history of killing products, but Google Voice is one of Google's oldest products, and it's such an established part of what they offer. I am concerned when Google releases new things, and it's the reason why I don't use many Google services. I don't know what's going to happen. But I feel like Google killing Google Voice would be the equivalent of them killing something like Google Docs at this point. I actually think the fact that you can have SMS messages behind the security of a Google account really fixes a lot of the security issues of SMS. And it's not a bad compromise if you're someone who already has a Google account and you don't mind utilizing Google just for Google Voice for this specific use case. Again, kind of understand the implications of the Google ecosystem and if that fits for you. My pseudo is great. I use my pseudo as well, but it just doesn't really work well with many banks. A lot of banks will flag the my pseudo number and I feel like I have better luck with the Google voice number. And I just haven't had to use my backup SIM cards. I don't know, that, that's kind of been working for me, but I feel like I've been getting really lucky. So I haven't really been stress tested in this realm yet. I actually kind of agree with you, especially with the Google voice thing. I was going to point that out too, is like the first time I heard about Google voice was literally 10 years ago. I think at this point, if Google was going to kill it, they would have killed it. I think your best option is to rely on phone numbers as little as possible and to just recognize that there is no ideal option. For things like banking, yes, if you can use even a Google voice number or any kind of voice over IP, that's going to be less susceptible to SIM swapping. At least with a Google account, you can, what's that called? Their, um, their advanced protection program. Yes, that thing, the advanced protection program, which like is pretty heavily locked down. You have to have like two different YubiKeys. I think you have to hit a point where you say, what's the sane limit? Because, you know, people have asked this about like domain names too. And it's like, what if my domain name gets taken away? And it's, you know, you pointed out in your question, like, unless you're a criminal, that's highly unlikely. And I think it's the same for these phone plans too. Like you mentioned with SIM, oh, you can't prepay if you miss a payment you could lose your number. Generally speaking, they're not going to auction off your number five minutes after the card failed. You can call them within at least a few days and get it reactivated. And you'll know pretty quick if your phone's been turned off. I would lean towards whatever voice over IP option works for you and just try to make sure you're staying on top of it, keeping bills paid for, and just try to use phone as little as possible. This is a good argument for threat modeling. Like what is the likelihood? What is uh, What are the threats? Things like that. Our next question comes from Kevin, and it is aimed specifically at me. Hey, Nate, I'm going to start experimenting with Cubes OS to see if it can act as my main desktop, but I have a question about using Elgato software with it. I'm going to stop you right there, and the answer is no. I'm half joking, but for real, I think the answer is no here. So you say currently you use two stream decks with a microphone and a camera from them as well, which all use Elgato software. The only one I can't live without is the stream deck and wanted to know if a cube running Windows can run the stream deck software and then allow me to use the macros across the entire system. If there is a macro pad like the stream deck that works perfectly fine with Linux and cubes, I am open to suggestions. So so here's, here's why I say no. GPU pass-through is incredibly unreliable from what I've told. I've never used it because by the time I was comfortable enough to use it, my current cubes device is actually like, it's what is it? The ThinkPad X230 or whatever. It's super old. I don't even think it has a GPU. I'm grateful for it for the record because it was a gift from someone, but 
it's just not a very powerful computer. I think if I even tried to do GPU pass through, I think it would just explode. It's also just very resource intensive. You didn't specify what you're going to use this for, but I'm judging from context, you're going to use it for like streaming or production or something. If you're going to try and run cubes, that's already a fairly high barrier to entry, at, at least for some people. And then if you're going to try to run Windows within cubes, you're going to need a lot of resources. And then if you're going to try to do production or streaming within Windows within cubes, honestly, you could probably just buy two laptops for that price. And you can have one that runs Windows very well, and you can have one that runs cubes very well. That said, in answer to your actual question, I strongly suspect that you cannot use the Stream Deck within Windows to trigger things, if I understand your question correctly, across the entire system. Because the whole point of cubes is that things are supposed to be like sandboxed and isolated. I know it can do that with YubiKeys and U2F, Fido, but I don't think it can really do anything else like that. It's specifically designed for Fido to be able to do that. So honestly, I, I don't think what you're trying to do is easily doable. And I think you're going to hit a lot of diminishing returns trying to pull it off. I do love cubes. I just don't think that's a good route to go down. Two things to say, neither of which have directly to do with the Elgato stream deck. The first thing is the whole point of cubes in my head is it's peak compartmentalization, but it's actually not peak compartmentalization because what's better than cubes OS having an actual computer for every operating system. It's unrealistic for most people, not something I actually suggest uh, unless you really need multiple devices. But in general, I would argue that the professional suite of tools on Linux, I don't think this is a hot take. Many of the professional tools available on Linux are just not as accessible, nor as normalized, nor as many options as you'll find if you're using a more mainstream operating system. And that's why you're trying to run Windows on cubes in the first place, right? And I feel like you're always going to have better luck with production tools that have direct access to your hardware. I know it feels wasteful. I don't like doing it, but I also have multiple devices for the same reason. It's how I'm able to still produce content for TechLore and all my other jobs because I'm able to separate things very nicely between devices that are optimized for specific tasks. Second thing I'll add, I did GPU pass through with a lot of help from TechLore community members on Fedora, not on Cubes. And it was both the coolest and most nightmare configuration I've ever had. It was super cool because like GPU performance was almost one-to-one -one matched inside of the, the VM essentially, but CPU performance was not as high. There was always weird issues that would come up and sometimes you just boot up your system and it just stops working for no reason and you have to spend a couple days troubleshooting it. And when it was used for work, uh, that was one of the most frustrating configurations I've ever had. I will say for the record, I've had that thought about like, I would love to play around with GPU pass through on cubes and see if like, in theory, if money were no object, could I buy a machine powerful enough where it's like, yes, I can pass the GPU through, I can allocate enough cores and RAM, and theoretically, I could just have one cubes device that also runs my Windows stuff, that has enough resources, and I can pass through all the necessary, my iLock, my, you know, DaVinci, all that fun stuff. But yeah, I mean, we're talking well over a $5,000 computer at that point easily. Right, and you just, you can't do everything, right? Like if, let's say you found that machine. Let's say, well, first, is it portable? Question mark, can you take it off your desk? Is it just a desktop? And if it's not, what's the battery life gonna be like? To power something like that, the battery life's gonna take a huge hit. Like, I, I really do think that there's a limit to what you can realistically get out of a single device, which I wish wasn't real because I wish I could just have one device for everything. But at the end of the day, iOS does better things than Android and Android does better things than iOS. And like Mac OS has some things going for it. The hardware for Apple has some things going for it, but like the software on Linux has some things going for it. And I feel like the best case scenario is kind of to like utilize the best thing of all the different options, but in a in the least wasteful way imaginable. Specificity of devices and like really maximizing what each device does well is something that is a good thing to also think about. And it's not something you have to take to the extreme, but it's something to consider. For the record, not really relevant, but I just like laptops for not the battery portability, but the literal like, oh, I'm going out of town for a week. I can bring my laptop and still do stuff. But yeah, those are all really good 
good points. And the last question is from Mr. Camel 999, who's a regular question asker for our Q and A's. And they asked, what is your recommended method of watching short form content like YouTube shorts, Instagram reels in the most private ways possible while still getting some sort of feed of videos? They found that using a web app for this purpose works for them to block ads. And they understand just not using those platforms would be the best, but they just want some opinions. I actually think what you're doing isn't too far from what I'd be doing. For the record, I don't really watch any of this because I don't really love the whole like fit as much as you can in under 60 seconds concept. I feel like I have to do it sometimes because that's what we have to do as creators, but I'm not really someone who like engages with it myself too much. All I'll say is that I would be doing what you're doing, which is probably still utilizing the platforms, but doing it in as private of a manner as I can. So um, that's where you're going to do some things like have a VPN turned on, maybe a dedicated browser. Using it in the web is always going to be a little bit better probably in most situations than having the native app installed. And same thing on mobile. You can access a lot of these things on mobile as well in your mobile browser. You can add the web app to your home screen probably as well. There's a lot of things you can do to pretty much just try to keep the apps off of your phone and then limit the kind of data that you're transmitting to the different websites. And if you have it in your browser, you can even do things like block trackers and block ads um, and things like that, which have many other benefits as well for your privacy and security. So the only other thing to add is if you want to take it a step further, you could have like dedicated devices that are configured in certain ways just for this. So like a more privacy invasive advice, but it's compartmentalized from your regular stuff. I agree. I'm pretty sure New Pipe used to do shorts, but that's specifically YouTube doesn't cover Instagram at all. I think if you can find a way to stay signed out, like maybe RSS, like I know there's a way to pull YouTube from RSS and it probably works on shorts. It does. I get, I, I get my daily Judge Judy shorts in my RSS feed. <laughs> okay. There's that. I don't really mess with shorts either. I know I've made a few on the new oil. I've been kind of experimenting with them and I've just, I've gotten so busy and the next video I'm working on is just such a beast of a video that I'm really struggling with it. But I agree. I think you're kind of doing the best you can. The only other thing I'd add is if there's a way you can be signed out so you can like use RSS to pull updates, or if you can find some sort of front end, like new pipe or something that is compatible with shorts and reels, then that would also be ideal. All right, and that's it for the Q&A this week. So again, how to kind of ensure control and ownership of a phone number, Cubes OS production challenges for people who want to use it for more production-oriented things, how to privately watch short-form content, and that's all we had this week. So uh, we could probably fit more questions in than three. So if you want to join the Q&A, go ahead and join it down below at patreon.com slash surveillance pod. We're leaving a link down there. So you just click that and you can leave a question right when you're watching this. So it's that simple. And it also contributes to our podcast and allows us to keep it free, hopefully forever. So thank you all for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.